Good. Henrik, hello. Hello. So, uh, how are you doing? Very good, thank you. We've got everyone here. Um, we've, got, we've got our guests joining now. So, um, over to you for some opening words and then we'll start the webinar. Yes. Uh, thanks and welcome to everybody for joining this webinar. It's the first of a series that we are doing in GWEC in re with regards to floating offshore wind. Uh, we will also do webinars for other uh, geographical areas, but we are starting here with, with, uh, with Europe. Um, as, as a baseline, uh, as you know, it, it's no surprise to anybody that GWEC is all about promoting wind energy and making sure that we have um, uh, maximum effort on, on the green transition based on wind. And as part of that, of course, uh, offshore wind has played a major role over the years and is playing an increasingly uh, large role due to the uh, fast advance of, of the cost competitiveness of offshore wind and the lastly unlimited resources we are looking into. How, having said that, there are, are significant areas of, of the world, including here in Europe, that cannot be served by conventional bottom fixed offshore wind. And therefore we are cranking up relatively dramatically our effort on, on floating offshore wind. And we have done that over a couple of years with efforts in various parts of the world, trying to uh, um, um, set in motion actions that could help governments set up suitable schemes for offshore flo floating offshore wind, trying to alleviate the concerns that may exist about um, uh, coexistence with other uh, elements in nature and in society and so on. And as part of that, we are having this webinar today as a, as a new thing where we are trying to expand our uh, joint knowledge about this important field. And we, I hope that everybody will have a, a, an interesting couple of hours. And I really look forward to hearing both the, the presenters and the subsequent debate. So thank you for joining and back to you again, Mef. Great, thank you, Henrik. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through an initial presentation uh, to show you the work that we've been engaged in and focus in on the recent report that, that GWEC has published on floating offshore wind. Um, I support Henrik in chairing um, as the vice chair of our task force. There's a lot of work GWEC is doing, essentially trying to build offshore wind in new markets. So one of the things we've done for many years within GWEC, um, first in onshore, now in offshore, is helping to raise understanding about the roles of wind technology, helping governments, policymakers, stakeholders in, in newer markets understand the role wind can play, the benefits that wind provides, et cetera, and then helping national associations and industry in country put in place the regulatory and policy frameworks. Um, We've been doing this in offshore wind for a number of years, focused, of course, in fixed, um, been working actively in Southeast Asia, um, for example, building frameworks and supporting action in Taiwan. Um, we've been active in China for many years now. Um, and we're now starting to do more and more, and we'll ask more and more questions about the role of floating. Um, a great example of that is last year, we worked very closely with the Japanese Wind Power Association and the Japanese government looking at a framework for offshore wind in Japan. And Japan, of course, will be heavily dominated by floating offshore technologies. And as part of doing that work, we, were, we wanted to understand which were the likely markets that may come through. Where was the potential greatest? Where were the early signs of market development? So we could support our members um, better and we could look at how we prioritize and we engage in some of those markets. And the, the report that we're going to talk you through today, we're going to focus on the European aspects of that report. That report was our, um, our attempt to do that. That We worked with Agar Insights, the consultants, to do that. And Maria Berzen is later going to talk through one aspect of the report. So um, in terms of today, just you know, I will first move my slides on. Here we go. So in terms of just the background for me, I vice chair, as the task force has said, but I'm also do support wider work in GWEC on floating offshore wind. Um, and I work on a number of other things, including as the advisor to the UK House of Commons, um, and work in my own consultancy, Lumen Energy and Environment. 
and work primarily in floating offshore wind supply chain issues. Um, in terms of floating offshore wind, in the report itself, we, we recounted some of the issues around floating. And in particular, we looked at what GWEC's own forecast for floating offshore wind is going to be. And this shows the GWEC forecast out to 2030. Um, there's a few things to sort of point out within this. One is that as, as we go over the decade, we see growing installations, of course, we see more countries engaged, but it's clear that the activity has been led in a number of countries, including South Korea and the UK. Equally though, most of the development activity is focused in the last half of the decade. Only 7% of it is gonna be delivered by the end of 2025. But most of it then is in the last three years. So the story of floating offshore wind for us, the GWEC is about um, this decade being one of first stage commercial projects, learning by doing, scaling up with bigger projects. Um, and, but the decade is a stepping stone into the 2030s. So 2030 is, um, while many governments have targets around 2030 and what they want to achieve for offshore wind by 2030, including the UK government, for example, and fixed and floating now, 2030 is, is, is not an important date in the sense that you know, we expect to see rapid acceleration into the 2030s of floating offshore wind. Um, we can see that in our own pipeline. In our 29, in a 2020 report, we forecast 6.4 gigawatts of offshore wind by the end of this decade, based on the pipeline and known activity of what we could see. A year later, we'd added a further 10 gigawatts to that 16. Um, if we do it again, who knows what we will see, but of course, with successful lease um, programs underway in multiple countries now, um, we're going to see more and more projects. It's the challenge is how fast those projects can deliver and how whether policy and other issues such as infrastructure, grid, etc., cetera, um, prevent rapid acceleration and push back some of that development. There's a lot of learning we need to do in floating offshore winds. So we need to be cautious and learn as we go but equally what this pipeline shows us is confidence in the market that the floating as a technology is understood expertise in offshore wind is obviously high we have a very experienced industry capable of delivering to that cost and that budget in multiple markets around the world now so we want to see floating accelerate successfully and within GWEC support making sure that the policy and regulatory environment is right to make that happen so onto the report itself already given you a brief summary of it. I um, want to pause though to say thank you to Shell. Um, Shell was a sponsor of this report and the, this webinar program. Um, this is the first webinar program, but we have a series of others looking at some of the different regions that come out of the report. Um, and in terms of what the report showed, it was a global look at emerging floating wind markets, as you can see here. I'm going to run through the, how we slimmed down to a smaller set of markets. Um, but we focused and looked at these different regions from North and South America and the Caribbean. We broke Europe into two to look at Northwest and Southern Europe. We also looked at Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia and Oceania. So we were keen to understand what was happening in different markets. Um, Europe um, and China are the, clearly the leaders at the moment in terms of fixed offshore wind delivery and Southeast Asia and America catching up quickly. We were keen to understand well, where might be the floating markets that could they could be the same they could be different it depends on a range of factors so we're talking about europe today we will be have a follow-on webinar in a few three weeks time to talk about the americas um, one on africa now uh, date confirmed and asia still waiting for the day but we will get that out because social media and gwec communication as soon as we have that so in terms of the methodology to to work out where floating might emerge first we needed to come up with a set of, of criteria. So these are the parameters we looked at. We looked at technical potential. We looked at whether there are constraints on the amount of fixed offshore wind that might come through. We looked at might, if there are, say, equivalent land constraints that might hold back um, prioritization, if you will, of other renewables such as solar that, that would therefore mean that countries would would need to look more widely for where their renewables might come from. We do see um, generically that success in renewables breeds confidence. So onshore markets, if they have offshore resources, will tend to move offshore as well. Um, but 
um, if those resources are constrained, the countries that have more greater ambition in the amount of renewables they want in their power mix, clearly floating will come through. Um, and then there were policy issues we looked at. Um, we looked at extent of renewables policy shown by the rise scores. Um, we looked at whether there were dedicated targets specific to floating if possible. And we also looked at hydrogen to see if there were commitments on hydrogen because we understand, of course, that the, the power to X work that's been going on in a number of countries, floating offshore wind could play a big part of that. And on the right, you can see what that applying those parameters meant in terms of taking a long list of 115 countries, which are all listed within the World Bank study and all have technical potential for offshore. Um, and then through a process of steps, taking them down um, first to a series of 30 markets, the original shortlist. We then worked with GWEX task force to look at those and to run a prioritization. And we pulled out five markets um, to do snapshots of. I'll talk through those five markets briefly. We're going to go on. Maria will talk through the, the relevant European ones in a few minutes. But um, I want to talk about what we learned from doing that as well. I'm not going to dwell on this. This is more on the slide pack for those of you to come back later. But this, these are the parameters scoped out in more detail. So you can see there was a one to four scoring system for each of those different issues. We we, we ran through and we had um, as much as possible very specific measures for how to how to score these markets. Um, having that methodology is important um, because it helps us to be sure about what's in and what's out and how you therefore score. And then equally for the in the work, and we're doing more of this um, within GWEC now. It's important in our wider COP engagement and our wider work on climate. But subsequent to the work some, that Ega did, some of what GWEC did was look at these markets that came through and we mapped them on in terms of carbon impact. So all those markets there um, are shown based on level of maturity, which is this color. So mature floating markets, markets, the five that we've termed chasing pack markets in light blue, and the other shortlisted markets in green. Uh, the size of the bubble shows the size of the floating offshore wind technical potential as outlined by the World Bank. But alongside that, we've got, we've mapped carbon intensity. So that's essentially how dirty the power mix is. And then along the bottom, emissions from electricity generation, which essentially shows how much the power sector emits. So therefore, obviously, larger economies such as China are out there on the right, um, the bigger, they therefore emit more, even if they're not, the power mix is not as, as dirty as some other markets. And that helps us and it helps, will help us in ongoing engagement to prioritize and talk to governments about, therefore, where offshore wind can make the biggest difference in markets in terms of cutting carbon. And in terms of then the, the ratings we, we did based on those scoring system, this is essentially the lead table. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, it showed if you're interested in particular markets, you can see how we scored them, um, where they came out at. But a critical thing to note is that if you look at that top five, it's not the top five that we did the snapshots from. Um, but the markets in the top are focused primarily in Europe. That's not a surprise. Um, Europe, Europe, European development of offshore wind in general is tends to be ahead. And there are a number of markets, Spain and Portugal, for example, are up there who are active in this space but don't have significant fixed um, resource. So we were clear, we understood why they would come through. However, um, we wanted to make sure we had a global breakdown. So it was decided that we would pick markets from around the world. We pick what we saw as representative markets to do that. Um, and that's how we ended up with a list of five, which I'll come through to. But for those five, what we then did, and what Ega did was look at the different drivers and constraints that they saw in the markets. And I tried to unpack those, explain them, see where there might be challenges. And we did this so we could better understand both in these individual countries or regions, um, because one of those was California, but equally what the critical issues could be for other um, markets that as they sought to develop. Um, and that's critical, I think really important is that the market is at a stage now where we can all learn from each other, but there's there's a lot of common issues that countries need to get right if they're going to see floating um, start to accelerate. 
Now, in terms of some takeaways from the report, um, there's a top 30. It's dominated by um, Western Europe, as I've said, but there were markets from across the globe in there. Um, there were only two countries from Asia in that top 30, even though Asia, you know, we all know is a, a very active market in, in offshore wind. Um, so we've got first movers in Asia, but within floating, the pitch is more mixed. Um, that, this excludes, of course, mature markets like Japan, which we've judged already on the road and active in floating. Um, so it's e easy to talk about regions, but actually it's more useful to, to then drill in and talk about individual countries. Um, and equally, what we've seen in the, the results is that while technical capacity is critical, once you've achieved a certain level of that, more important is policy. It's about having effective policy and leadership that drives that. And that, of course, means that it, it's not, the resource, yes, once you've got it, um, is important, but it's then how governments work, which will depend on, if you like, their, their place in that league table. Um, and the prioritization which industry might put on those different markets and the focus. And for, so, the, so for a number of countries, we're clear that actually what they can do is, if they're active and keen on floating, they can, they can, get, they can get noticed in this early stage of floating commercialization and potentially therefore get more of the benefits from early stage commercialization of this technology. And then final note from me is, we have, uh, these are the five countries. We're gonna talk through Ireland and Italy today, but we also highlighted Morocco, early stage market, government commitments around renewables, desire to increase their own energy security, um, a significant resource, lack of access on fixed. So we see that uh, Morocco is a really good case study about how um, a non-traditional market could evolve, could support floating offshore wind. Similarly, in the Philippines, um, high economic growth, there's a demand for more electricity, there's some really good floating offshore wind sites. Um, GWEC, alongside this, is worth flagging his work, has been working with the World Bank and others looking at the Philippines as a market. Um, so we see that if infrastructure and tariff problems can be addressed, then the Philippines is a significant market. And then finally, of course, the USA, focused on the Pacific and California, um, probably alongside Ireland, the market that's most developed and almost ready to go. Um, and a lot of work being done right now by the um, by Boehm and, and the states looking at auction processes, et cetera. But there are some challenges there around grid. Um, and of course, it's a very deep market. So it's, there are some differences in that market we need to look at. Okay, that is it for me in terms of the report itself. It's available on our website if you want to go and get a copy if you've not seen already. Also worth flagging, we recently published our updated global markets report looking at onshore and offshore wind forecasts. So please do go away and use those two great resources. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Lisette. Lisette um, has been working with us in this work and we're very, really pleased with GWEC to be doing this webinar jointly with Wind Europe. Uh, Lisette is going to talk through Wind Europe's work and give her perspective on, on the wider European floating offshore wind market. So Lizette, I will stop sharing um, and hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Maf and Henrik for that uh, very warm introduction. I am very delighted to be here today. Uh, please also just uh, give me one second. Now it should be sharing my screen. Thank you very much. So my name is Lizette Ramirez. I am analyst for Offshore Wind at Wind Europe now for the past three years. I am also the content coordinator for our working group on floating offshore wind, which is one of the largest uh, groups uh, that brings together all of the supply chain for floating wind. Now, today I'd like to focus on our recent work, which is a position paper that looks at how to scale up floating offshore wind in Europe. So for this position paper, we have analyzed eight different countries which have either uh, an ambition or already a commitment to do floating offshore wind. Now, this doesn't mean that the policies are the best or suitable for the execution of these plans. So that's why the position paper is divided into two main parts. The first one is addressing our recommendations to the EU institutions. 
So this is mainly on how to handle the infrastructure investments and how they can support the supply chain. On the other hand, we also give 10 recommendations to the national authorities and governments on how they can follow a series of steps that will enable the best policies to make floating wind commercial scale projects. Why is this so relevant? Because here I'd like to point at two things that have been said by Henrik and Math. The first one is that, well, unfortunately, not everywhere in Europe or in the world, we have shallow waters together with wind resource. That means we will always need floating wind as a solution to bring and unlock the potential of offshore wind. The second is also as shown in the slide by MAF that actually from the top five uh, markets in scores, four of these are located in Europe. So this is also showing the big potential that Europe has to build on top of its experience for bottom fixed and now to continue being the leader in floating wind. So if you would like to take a look to the position paper, I invite you to go to the following link. And now I will move on. Today, Europe is leading in floating offshore wind capacity. We have 111 megawatts operational, and this is about 80% of all of the global install capacity. This photo is the King Cardane wind farm. This is at the moment, the largest operational wind farm for floating wind. It also stands with the currently largest floating wind turbines. They are nine and a half megawatts. And this basically means that floating offshore wind has already catch up with bottom fix. We are installing the same turbines and it's not an RNI or a demonstration technology anymore. It is ready for scaling up. And for many, many years, we've been told that we need more uh, insurance in the pipeline. We don't have enough pipeline, but that has actually changed. And this is about to change how much of floating wind we have in Europe. Because even if we are the leading uh, region at the moment, these 111 megawatts represent only less than 1% of all of offshore wind installed capacity today in Europe. How is this going to change? Well, Europe can do at least seven gigawatts operational by the end of this decade. Today, as I was mentioning, we have only few projects online. Two are located in the UK. One is located in Portugal and we have demonstration projects in other countries. In the next two years, we are going to triple the installed capacity in Europe, mainly with the addition of projects which are pre-commercial projects in France and also with the construction that is currently happening of the high wind tampon in Norway and more projects. But then by the end of the decade, this is of course a very big step. And as you can see also from this figure, more and new different countries will ship into delivering the seven gigawatts. So from this figure, you can see how countries further south from Europe will come to be players into floating wind. This is mainly due to the water depth that they have available where there is also with good wind resource, which makes it very suitable for floating wind. And this is in terms of capacity, but now how does this capacity translate into benefits of a scale and how is this going to bring further down the cost of floating wind which at the moment there is a perception that might be high in this photo you can see how the pace of the cost reduction it's actually mainly driven by the volume so i want to make a distinction in the previous figure it was shown by year so by 2030 we could have uh, at least seven gigawatts in this figure, we have how the LCOE projection will change according to the cumulative installed capacity. So really, the amount of gigawatts installed and how fast we can deliver on all of these projects that are already in the pipeline will, deliver, will define the pace of this cost reduction. There are several things I'd like to highlight in this figure too. The first is that, well, 
as you can see, the very first seven to 10 gigawatts in the figure has the steepest cost reduction. This is mainly because of the uh, introduction of auctions, larger projects, and benefits of economies of scale. We are sure and confident that we can deliver this because we can build on of all of our experience from the bottom fix, but also from the oil and gas sector, which shares a lot of routes with floating offshore wind. And this also then is translated into different countries, but the policies are into different levels of establishment. So we have some countries, we have a very, let's say high ambition, but the regulatory framework for floating wind is still not the most suitable and others are more advanced in these steps. So in this figure, you can see from the left to the right, it's a qualitative analysis on how advanced these policies are to be suitable to deliver commercial floating wind farms. One very important message I like to give from this slide is that the current context in Europe for um, the energy security has made a lot of countries consider on increasing their targets. As an example, I'd like to point here that the UK has just recently announced an increase from one gigawatt to five gigawatt of floating wind. So it is very interesting to see how a country, which most people would think is gonna deliver their offshore wind target, mostly with bottom fix, because they have a lot of good wind resource in shallow waters. It's also the one with the highest target for floating wind. We have other examples. We have uh, Spain who has recently launched the offshore wind roadmap and they are planning to open the very first auction early 2023. Other countries with, let's say, unofficial targets, but still a very good opportunity to formalize this are Greece, who at the moment don't have any kind of uh, breakdown but for fixed and floating or offshore and onshore in their NECP, which is their National Energy and Climate Plan. And the energy minister had verbally said that they would like to install not one and a half, but now two gigawatts of floating wind by 2030. Another very important example, because today is very relevant, is Ireland. Ireland, the new government coalition has already increased the target of offshore wind to 2030. It was originally 3.5 gigawatts. Now it's five, and we're very happy about this. However, we know that the very first phase will mainly go to bottom fixed projects, and they still have the chance to use this 1.5 gigawatt that has to be fulfilled for the target with floating wind to make this and unlock all of their potential in the West Coast. So finally, I like to uh, say some of the main recommendations from our position paper. Uh, as to remind you, to remind you, there are in total 15 which are addressing different actors. But here I like to point at the main five. First, all countries should make use of the review of the National Energy and Climate Plan to set new targets, also with the context of Repower EU, which is bringing additional volumes of renewables to ensure there is energy uh, for all of Europeans. And additionally, they need to ensure not only this, but that there is enough space allocated through the maritime special plants in deep waters. The second is to ensure that there are recurrent technology specific or let's say floating auctions in which there is some kind of support granted. Why is it important? At the moment, we advocate for a two-sided CFD. We, very, we like very much what the UK is doing and they are setting a slightly different price that will support floating wind to decrease the cost in the coming years, and it will continue to decrease then um, the support given. The third is to tackle the financing costs. There are still certain risks perceived by investors, and these can be assured or reduced by working into this topic. 
The fourth, and sometimes a bit neglected, is making floating green connections a top priority. This is because the TSOs, need, who are the transmission system operators of a country, have to work together with the developers or with the rest of the supply chain to bring the solutions like floating substations, the export dynamic cables that we still are in testing phase or design phase and so on. And finally, we ask to facilitate the industrialization of the supply chain, ports and any other type of mass productor infrastructure. Why is this crucial? Because now we are at the point where there is a big pipeline and it can really be realized, but there is a bridge now to go from the pre-commercial to the commercial scale. So these are uh, five main recommendations. I will, of course, uh, wait now for the panel debate and I'd like to highlight then more examples from other European countries. Thank you very much, Mav. Back to you. If you are muted. I think you are muted. Ma Matthew, Sorry. you need to unmute. <laughs> hmm. There we go. Right. Sorry about that, everyone. Right. Lizette, thank you very much for that. That's really helpful. If you could. Um, unshare, um, and we'll then move on to Maria. Uh, Maria worked with us at GWEC as part of the EGA team to on, on this really important report, and and so we're delighted you can join us, Maria, to give us your view about two of the particular markets you highlighted around market snapshots for, which is Ireland and Italy. So, Maria, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, while I'm getting presenters right, I'll uh, just do a brief, uh, very brief introduction. Uh, I'm Maria Bolton, I'm Head of Research and Analytics at the EGIA Insights. Um, EGIA might be a bit of a funny name, but EGIA is actually a figure in the news mythology preceding over stormy seas. And uh, similarly at the EGIA Insights, we're looking to deceive all of the work we're doing, uh, doing uh, market research and analysis for offshore wind around the world with a strong focus on emerging market and technologies. So this report kind of fits both of those, both emerging markets, but also emerging technologies in the form of floating wind. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with the, the GWEC team and, and the GWEC task force on floating wind in, in both the market screening and the, the market snapshots uh, where we got great input to, to get the report to where it is where it is now. Yes, and uh, as Matt mentioned, uh, in Europe, we decided to focus on two markets, Ireland and Italy, as two of the potential markets who could be following the front running uh, floating markets um, after it takes off. Both of these markets have good technical potential for floating wind. Um, the chart shown here is technical potential, meaning it doesn't consider um, other uses of maritime areas. It's purely wind speed, water depth coupled together and then seeing what, the, what that looks like. The chart also shows that it differs quite a bit between the two markets. Um, and what also differs is, is taking a closer look at the parameters that Matt mentioned, uh, the parameters relevant for developing uh, offshore wind, which we'll take a closer look at now. Starting with, with Ireland, it's a market that has great wind resources and it has significant potential for shallow floating wind. Um, the wind speeds range between 11, uh, sorry, 8 and 11 meters per second. And in some of the most relevant uh, areas for development, it averages around 10 meters per second. There's some fixed bottom potential, um, also some fixed bottom projects. Uh, the, the potential tends to be quite close to shore, uh, but the really big potential happens when we go further from shore into the shallow floating area between 60 and 200 meters, where it goes up to 200, sorry, 450 gigawatts of potential. 
looking a bit at the broader energy system, uh, Ireland in the past has struggled with meeting renewable targets. And in 2020, Ireland had to buy renewable shares from other European countries in order to meet the EU target that was set at 16% of renewables in the energy mix. And following that, the, the national targets for renewables in Ireland have been increased to 80% renewables in the electricity mix in 2030. Um, and a much longer term uh, ambition of up to 30 gigawatts of floating wind for both domestic use and, and export has been stated. Um, so the goal is set high and, and the, the steps on how to get there uh, are going to be interested to dive into and to follow. The policy setup, um, a framework has been introduced where auctions are planned and for the first auction, um, a support scheme has also been set in place. Um, there's no experience on how that works in practice, since it's still to come, um, but it's a very positive first step towards the, the development of a floating wind. When it comes to permitting, um, there's been some some struggles in the past, but there's a there's a setup uh, with the recent maritime area plan and they also new uh, authority to come the maritime area regulatory authority, which should update and improve the the permitting setup. Looking at the developer side of it, the, there's been great interest in the Irish market, both when it comes to to fixed bottom and to floating. Um, the fixed bottom projects that, that we've looked into, we also did a market report on Ireland following this uh, this GWAC report, um, where we, we looked in more, in more detail at, at some of the projects that were announced there. So fixed bottom projects are roughly 12 gigawatts and, and floating projects are roughly 10 gigawatts at different stages of planning and development. This was a very quick helicopter view. Uh, I'll dive into more detail uh, on some of these topics. Um, the renewable targets in general and also the, the more specific floating wind ambitions specifically set quite a favorable policy environment in, in Ireland for de development and, and scaling up of floating wind. And the, the auctions to come, the planned auctions, and the fact that there's a two-way CFD, which was also mentioned by Lisette, uh, gives quite a positive outlook for uh, for how the development could be for, for offshore wind in Ireland. The permitting is, it tends to be an issue in a lot of the markets that we looked at, both in the GWIC report, but also some of the markets that we look at in uh, at Ikea Insights. Um, the maritime area plan, the new authority to, to set up could be a solution to, to make this smoother in Ireland. Um, we still see some uncertainty in actually getting the authority established, with, which is expected next year, but also how will it function in practice once it is established? Will there be sufficient resources? Will there be any delays? Um, that's still unknown and still to come. Looking at the supply chain, there is a, a, an onshore wind supply chain has developed in Ireland. Um, but once we go offshore, and especially once we go to floating wind, uh, it is likely that the Irish market could use some of the supply chain in the UK or in other uh, northern European markets. Uh, more critically is the port setup. Uh, currently, there's no ports with the sufficient facilities or, or requirements to support offshore winds. Um, or floating offshore wind for that matter, uh, there are some, some plans and intentions to, uh, to expand and improve, um, but whether that will have at sufficient scale and in sufficient time still involves uh, some level of uncertainty. The transmission grid in Ireland, it's, uh, it's pretty well connected, especially along the coastal areas, but it's a grid that was built for fossil fuels and not for large scale offshore wind. Um, so it's not necessarily geared for all of the wind that's to come. It's a focus of the, the Irish TSO, um, both 
of your electricity transmission and also the fact that the onshore grid might not necessarily have the right capacity in the right places. So there are plans in place, um, but again, these plans have to actually happen in practice and in real life. Um, and whether that's going to be timely enough for the projects is something to follow quite closely. We did a scoring of the most central parameters um, that we looked at ac across um, the different aspects of Ireland. And we zoomed in on, on the grid, which is very central in, in all markets. Um, we classified this as, as quite favorable with the, the focus and the plans in place. Um, as I just said, nothing is completely certain until the plans have actually been followed and, and the, the upgrades have been made. Less favorable is the port infrastructure and the port situation. Um, there, will, there will be some need some, some significant upgrades um, and there has been a policy statement from, uh, from the government with the intention of upgrading ports um, without the details necessarily there. So for us, that's, uh, that's definitely an item to follow uh, quite closely in Ireland. We have some confidence that the permitting regime will develop uh, in the right direction with the, with the recent bill, with the, with the new authority to come. Um, still something to follow closely and, and hopefully they will get the sufficient resources and, and also get started in time to uh, to actually provide permits for the for the projects, the many projects in the pipeline. We started the, with the bottom parameter by looking at other renewables, which have received quite low prices in, in some of the recent the renewables options in Ireland. And it changes a bit the fact that there's going to be a dedicated option set up and support set up for offshore wind. Um, Floating will will be competing in that, so so there is still a, a level of competition uh, when it comes to to cost levels and prices. But the fact that there's a dedicated offshore setup um, means that we we assess this parameter as being quite favorable. Yes, so floating wind is quite a game changer when we look at Ireland. Uh, there's fixed bottom potential, but the vast majority of potential is floating. Um, and the levelized cost of energy heat map that we show here is only showing the area relevant for floating wind. If you look along the coastline, maybe just to say that the dark green means low levelized cost of energy and the yellow going towards red are, are the increasing cost levels. So you wanna be in the dark green. Um, and along the coastline, you find the lowest levels of levelized cost of energy. And it, it tends to range between 55 and 60 euros per megawatt hour, which is also the level that you find around Dublin and Cork, which have some of the largest load centers and industrial areas uh, to offtake the, the electricity. The very lowest level of levelized cost of energy is found on the west coast um, towards the Atlantic Ocean, um, great wind condition but less offtake, uh, less electricity demand in that part of the country. Moving on to Italy. Um, it's a very interesting market. It, it's, there's definitely floating wind potential, but it's a market with more moderate wind speeds than what we see in Ireland. Um, there's also deep waters. There's very limited, uh, fixed bottom potential and the water gets even deeper than it does in Ireland. So we both have like a shallow, intermediate and deep water um, floating segment when we look at the Italian market. Wind speeds in some of the attractive sites go up to around eight and a half meters per second, but there's also areas where we are as low as, as six or seven. It also means that in some of the assessments we've done, exam, for example, the, the levelized cost of energy heat map that I'm going to show in the end, we actually lowered our standard seven meters per second limit down to six in order to look at a wider area uh, in Italy than what we would normally do. 
the most economically viable resources are found in, in southern Italy and around the islands of Sardinia and, and Sicily. And the, the very limited potential for fixed bottom means that, that Italy will basically emerge as a floating wind market um, when it enters the, the offshore wind development. We looked at shallow floating and intermediate floating and combined that roughly 100 gigawatts of potential um, which could be developed. The energy mix in, in Italy is quite dependent on gas, both when it comes to the production of electricity, where it makes up almost half of the resources used, but also when we look at the, the broader energy system where, where gas is quite central in, in heating in Italy. And with the recent geopolitical events, the Italian government has stated that they have a plan to end the reliance on Russian gas as soon as 2025. This could seem like a long time away, but it actually means that very recently six onshore wind projects were fast tracked through the permitting in an effort to cut the reliance on, on, on gas. So this could potentially be, be a, a fuel and a drive towards the faster offshore wind development as well. If you look at the report uh, from GWEC, um, in several places it will say that the framework and the support scheme for offshore wind in Italy isn't there at the moment, which was completely true when we made the report, but this is a world where things happen and develop quite, quite quickly. Um, so in March, a draft of the FER2 decree, which is a specific legislation of the implementation of the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, Sorry for becoming a little legislation specific here, but but that draft basically sets up the, the framework for future renewables auctions and, and future support uh, schemes. And this setup has a dedicated bucket for floating offshore wind. Um, not just offshore wind, but floating offshore wind. So that means that some of the some of the statements in the, in the report, a lot of it is is still accurate but but what i'm what i'm going to present here is uh, is slightly different in some aspects another focus is the permitting in italy which has received quite a lot of critique for being complex and time consuming um, there are plans to simplify it and speed it up but as i said with ireland um Intention and plans are very good, but it's going to be interesting to see what actually happens in practice, like how is it changed and how does it work when developers are starting to use new uh, permitting procedures. Italy is a market, as I said, like moderate wind speeds, deep water, but it is also a market with quite intense developer interest. Um, the first offshore wind project is being installed as we speak, uh, close to Toronto. Um, and in October last year, the TSO received 39 applications for, for grid connection from offshore wind developers. So there's quite an influx of developers and interest in the Italian market. This could potentially signal that there are some economically viable and attractive sites, and there could be a play to be become a first mover in the floating wind market in Italy. Um, Italy has previously had a relatively low target for offshore wind of 900 megawatts. Um, it's been criticized for being insufficient and also quite unambitious. Um, in the latest, the FER2 decree, there is an aim, or at least there is, it's mentioned that the support can be given to up to three and a half gigawatts of, uh, of offshore wind, which is significantly more than 900 megawatts, but also comparing to other markets, um, whether that's ambitious enough, I'll, I'll think I'll leave that to the industry organizations to assess. Um, but there is increasing ambitions happening in, in its city at the moment. Also with the, with the support scheme, as mentioned in the past, there hasn't been something dedicated for offshore wind. Uh, it's actually not been mentioned as a, as a renewables group in the framework and the support scheme, which it potentially will now. Um, there's the draft of the decree. It still has to be improved and implemented. 
uh, but it's a step in the right direction for sure. Some of the issues that have been with permitting is that there's been limited possibilities of changing technology or, or aspects of the projects without delaying or having to start over with the permitting process. There's an aim or the aims to simplify this, which have been stated in the, the National Energy and Climate Plan and also with the, with the recent simplification decree. Italy has quite a lot of onshore wind and, and therefore also an established supply chain for that. Um, some of those could be relevant to move into offshore, uh, but also other so Southern European markets are moving when it comes to offshore wind and also when it comes to floating offshore wind. So it, it's likely that that components could also come from, from other European markets. Italy has several relevant and large ports close to the areas that, that they, it makes sense to do offshore wind. They will likely need investments for upgrades as there are certain uh, requirements and facilities needed for offshore wind, but it's it seems to be less of an issue in Italy than it is in Ireland. When it comes to grid, the, it's quite extensive across Italy. There's also connection to Sardinia, meaning that, that any areas of Sardinia could be once connected at Sardinia could be fed into the rest of the electricity grid. And it's also a focus of the TSO to promote renewable energy, uh, which they've stated in their in the latest development plan from 2021. During the same scoring of, of central parameters that we did for Ireland, um, the parameters are a little different. We, we've chosen the ones that are relevant for the specific market. Um, we looked at the grid development and assessed that with the current grid and also with the plans in place, we, we consider that to be quite favorable in Italy. Um, unambitious offshore wind targets based on the 900 megawatts uh, that was previously stated, we considered it relatively unfavorable. Um, I put a little green circle around it here to indicate that it might be increasing with the introduction of the of the latest the decree. A permitting regime, as stated, it, it's been quite complex, uh, time consuming, rigid, um, and there are plans to improve it and speed it up. Um, until that becomes more specific, we, we would still consider this as yeah, in, in the middle of the field in our favorable scale. Um, we also have price competition and, and, and focus on subsidies, where in previous or in recent auctions focusing on renewables, uh, solar and onshore wind have had like relatively low in an Italian context, um, feed in tariffs, which floating wind would have been very unlikely to compete with. With the draft decree, um, there could be a dedicated support scheme introduced for, for floating off your wind, which would mean that this direct competition uh, isn't relevant to the same extent, at least not for launching and, and doing the initial scale of, of floating wind in Italy. Also meaning that I put a little green circle around this scale um, compared to what we, uh, we put in the report and the market snapshot there. Looking at the, the heat map of levelized cost of energy, um, this is also areas that are relevant for floating only. We, we took out areas for, for fixed bottom, even though there's not that many in, in Italy. The LCOE levels are relatively high in Italy, which is mainly due to the moderate wind speeds. When you're down to eight and a half meters per second, you get relatively lower uh, L3 levels, especially when you're comparing directly to a market like Ireland, where you have in some places between 10 and 11 uh, meters per second. The most attractive areas are found in, in southern Italy, uh, close to the or off the coast of, of Puglia, um, and also around Sicily and, and Sardinia uh, have the clearest uh, dark green uh, indications with the lowest L3 levels. 
we also see some smaller pockets of of, of relevant areas um, around the region of uh, Calabria and also around the Genoa in the very north of, of Italy. So, as I started out by saying, it's two markets that share a potential to become uh, the chasing the pack markets in the floating wind space, um, but it's also two quite different markets when it comes to site conditions, potential um, opportunities and challenges. However, one thing they do have in common is it's it's built markets where there's a quite keen developer interest in, in the floating field um, and in developing floating offshore wind. And on that intriguing note, I will hand back to you, Matt. Thank you. Maria, thank you. That was great um, presentation. Lots of lots of great content for us to get into. Um, we're running to time. Um, thank you for everyone for keeping us to time so far. Um, we're going to move to our panel session. Um, before I do, I'm going to introduce everyone. Um, also worth saying to you in the audience, we've got a few prepped questions, as you'd expect, for our panel, but I'm really keen to hear what you've got to say. Um, so please do. Um, Please do use the Q&A function within Zoom um, to give us you know, any questions you've got for the panel. If you've got it, to, if it's generic for everyone, um, just type your question. If you'd like it to go to a particular person, can you say who it's to or who you'd like to respond? I might throw it open as well, depending on what, what people say. Um, so Maria and um, Lizette will be staying and joining us, but I'm also delighted to introduce um, the three people who are gonna give us um, market perspectives. Um, so first, um, Nal Godwin from Wind Energy Ireland, um, uh, David Astasio Garcia from ANEV, the Italian Wind Energy Association, and Carolina Pizak from Simply Blue Energy. So thank you, the three of you, for joining us. Um, first, if I can come to you now, let's look at the Irish market. So and we've heard there about lots of ambition at a very high level. Um, we've heard about you know, in both those markets, there's a portfolio of projects. There's definite developer interest, but equally, you know, in, if you think about what's happening in um, uh, in, the, in terms of Irish policy, policy is not necessarily catching up. Government has these high-level ambitions, but as Maria said, that's not been turned into a specific target or or, or activity that can drive floating offshore wind. So, what do we need to do now? Um, What's the next steps for the Irish government if it really does want to accelerate floating offshore wind? Yeah, thanks very much, Maf, and 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 to Maria for the presentation. I thought it was really interesting to to get that overview and and I had a read of the report before the event, and you know, really good good summary of the Irish situation. Um, you know, I think you've probably hit on some of the key challenges in your own presentation, Maria, just around new state agency called Mara and um, that's going to handle some of that kind of permitting uh, processes. I think it's really, really key that we get that up and running as soon as possible so we can really get these projects into the planning system. Um, I think you also called out the point around that certainty around our auctions. You know, we are now at the moment starting to look likely that it'll be two auctions for 2030 at this stage and um, the first one opening later this year. Um, but we do need that certainty around the second auction and, and that pathway for delivery for the next phase of project. So in Ireland, we're for 2030, we're grouped into two phases. Phase one, which will compete in the first auction, six projects, all of them are, are fixed bottom. But then it's phase two where, you know, there's probably a real opportunity um, that, that, that'll that be the auction that bridges the gap up to that five gigawatt target that Maria mentioned. And that's probably the real one that that kind of has that potential to, to unlock floating wind. Um, I agree with Maria what she said there, floating wind is a game changer. Um, and I think it'll really enable us to, to not only decarbonize our own economy, uh, but also, you know, contribute to the decarbonization of the rest of Europe um, in line with the targets set out in the European Green Deal and, and particularly important in the current context. This is so important, you know, the current geopolitical context, we need to move away uh, from imported fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Uh, Matthew rightly pointed out, we have ambition in Ireland, you know, for 2030, that five gigawatt capacity um, target that, that we are still confident of meeting. Uh, and then that 30 gigawatt target that's set out in 
uh, what we call the programme for government. So the, the sort of the coalition agreement between, between our governing parties that sets out that longer term target of 30 gigawatts for, for, for beyond that. No firm date on that, as, as you correctly point out, Maf, and that's probably where we are now. We need to see how we can translate that into clear concrete policy actions. Um, probably step one, is getting offshore off the ground in Ireland. That starts with the delivery of the five gigawatts. And that's very much where the government's atten attention is currently, getting the, the right frameworks around grid, around route to market, around planning. And, and that first auction to, to open later this year and probably take place early next year, uh, where we'll see the bidding and, uh, and getting those first batch of projects away. That second auction is crucial. Uh, that'll happen around 2024, 2025. Um, and, you know, that's where floating comes in. Matt, you mentioned that this decade is a stepping stone to the 2030s. Couldn't agree more. Um, and with that in mind, we think that when we get to that second auction in Ireland in the middle of this decade, that we think a, a separate floating wind pot will be needed um, in, in order to kind of support those early commercial scale floating projects. We, we think we have a real opportunity there um, to kind of support them early, get our supply chain up and running and, and, and start to kind of, you know, you know, get give an industry a kickstart essentially for what is a new industry in Ireland. There, there's a lot that will be needed in in conjunction with this. We will need to strengthen strengthen the grid, as as Maria said. Our TSO has a plan to strengthen the grid out to 2030. Um, but you know, we need to start looking beyond this as well. What comes after 2030? Where where is the capacity going to be available um, for for projects that go beyond that five gigawatt target. And then also what are the other offtakes? You know, probably if you look at Ireland's Ireland's demand, we have a current demand of about 30 terawatt hours that might go up to about 40, 45 by 2030. You know, that might mean we use 25, 30 gigawatts of, of our offshore, but a lot of that goes beyond that will be exported. So we'll be looking at hydrogen offtakes uh, and super, uh, you know, your, the idea of a European super grid, that sort of interconnected cooperation between um, Different governments and, and 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 TSOs at European level to to kind of connect up systems and enable the the kind of shift of uh, renewable energy where the resource is best, like Ireland, and over to the kind of high demand centres across Europe. So you know, I think the key point here in terms of concrete action is get the planning system up and running, strengthen the grid, and and get the the first auction uh, for floating. Or sorry, the, the first auction that that floating can compete in. The, the second auction in the middle of this decade, uh, certainty on that as quickly as possible. I don't know if we lost math. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> So if, if I may, uh, I can uh, uh, shadow a bit while we get math back. Yeah. And I believe now we can also look at Italy because this is the other market that was presented by Maria. It's uh, very imminent that there is, a, it's a hot market at the moment. There has been at least 64 requests for a grid access to the TSO, and but there is not really um, a regulatory framework in place to do floating wind projects. So, David, can you tell us a bit more of and uh, from all of us? Uh, on port, I, I hear um, much, sorry. It doesn't have fast harbor. That, that could well be a, a port a port question for me. So, I, I don't know, Lizette, will, will I take that or do you want to keep going with the, with the Italy question? I will, uh, I will message Muff that he yeah. uh, might not be aware that we are having some issues from his yeah. side yeah. on the connection. So let's just take this one and then we go back to the ports. So David, what is the context now in Italy and what is the country doing to, um, well, now at the moment we have the finally the first project, Taranto, but it's what on fix and what is the country then doing about the regulatory framework? Yes, thank you for inviting uh, us as the Italian Energy Association. First of all, I have to make my congratulations with Maria because uh, she clearly presented the, the Italian pictures, very uh, current uh, and very detailed one. Uh, the only consideration I can um, add, first of all, before I, I forget to answer a question here in the chat, uh, someone asked if the tariff of uh, 
165 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, it's a um, uh, feeding tariff of two sides CFD is the second option, uh, two sides CFD. So it means that the price can only be lower. It's like the option in the uh, onshore in Italy. So um, the situation is more or less the one you, you have uh, described. So the potential is really interesting. Uh, we received the, the Italian TSO, Terna received uh, more than 40 um, requests for grid connection, more than uh, 40 gigawatt of wind power. The main areas are the ones that you pinpointed in the maps. Uh, in the west side of Sicily, Sardinia, and the, the, the southern part of the Adriatic Sea. And most of them will be uh, floating because, as you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, we had the problem for installing bottom fixed. Um, so now with the new floating technologies, we, we have much more room for installing uh, wind in areas that are far away from the seasides. In Italy, as you know, the landscaping uh, impact and constraint is one of the key aspects that have been uh, is considered by the Italian superintendencies, mainly from the Ministry of the Culture, both onshore, but offshore. So it seems that the floating can be a very win-win uh, 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 solution for our uh, for our country from here to the next year. What are the the, the critical aspects? As you mentioned today. As you mentioned, the, the, the first one is the bottom fix in front of Taranto Herbal. <coughs> and this plant needs 16 years. It started 16 years ago. So to, to have a, a, a time dimension of what is happening in our country. So today we have the inauguration. We have <coughs> a, a situation where even if it's in front of Ilva Farm, in front of the Herborn in a very industrialized site. Uh, they, they received the many negative um, feedbacks. So uh, the same is happening in some uh, projects that are under development, even uh, far away from the Italian coast. The bigger example is the one of Renexia, the same one that is the owner of uh, Taranto bottom fix uh, wind farm. Beleolico Renexia, it's a 2.7 uh, uh, gigawatt, uh, 60 kilometers from, far away from the western coast of Sicily, in the Sicily Channel between Sicily and, and uh, Tunisia. And even they received a negative feedback from the Sicily region. It's 60 kilometers far away, so it's nothing that can be considered. So, of course, they are con continuing their um, their. Uh, a process for getting the authorization, but this is one of the key aspects, that one of the uh, main aspects for um, for the Italian wind uh, farms, both offshore and offshore, onshore. Other consideration about the, the question, the Italian government and the, the, the new draft of the, the decree uh, FER2, we call FER2, we were waiting for this decree for two, three years, uh, so the regulatory framework in Italy is not so stable. Now they are trying to simplify as much as possible the procedures, not only for getting the target of the National Energy and Climate Plan, that where we have to double more or less the, the, the wind power installed in Italy, onshore and then offshore. Uh, this decree, as you mentioned, the foreseen 3.5 gigawatt of for, uh, offshore wind. Uh, the, the critical aspects very briefly are that the decree considers only floating. That's good because uh, the, the main part will be floating, but they cannot omit bottom fix because there are some plans, some projects in the Adiatric, for example, from Saib and from Kintix, that uh, consider also bottom fix to buy because the, other, the Adriatic Sea is quite, the bathymetry are lower. So we, we cannot exclude this option. And, uh, and secondly, someone said that 3.5 gigawatts are very low number compared with the request of connection uh, that are 10 times bigger. But uh, we have to remind that this decree is from here to 2027. And frankly speaking, 
in Italy, I believe that we will not install 3.5 gigawatt from here to 3000 to 2027 because of this very long bureaucracy for the authorization procedure. So of course the potential is bigger, but the main rule will be the main rule, the main uh, contribution of offshore wind, offshore wind in our country will be given uh, maybe in 2030 later. It's important to work now, it's important to start with the project, it's important to invest, it's important to speak with the institution, but on the other side, uh, the, the times are very, very long. Uh, so that's the, 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 my contribution uh, about our country. David, uh, thank you very much for that. Lizette as well, thank you for filling in while I disappeared and and came back in. Sorry, everyone, I got dumped off my computer. Um, can I just, if I just want to ask both of you if I can about ports, uh, then Carly and I'd like to bring you in, get your spirit from the market. But in both countries, infrastructure is something that's that's highlighted. Um, is enough uh, being done um, to sort of make sure the ports are ready? There's obviously a lot of development and pipeline activity, as I said at the beginning, in both Italy and in Ireland. But we need to get ports and infrastructure ready to, if we're going to capitalize on the, some of the benefits of floating. David, do you see that there's enough being done to make sure the ports are in the right place to, to develop floating offshore wind? For Italy, uh, I think that there is a big challenge for port infrastructure because we don't still don't have the enough uh, competitive um, infrastructure for. Uh, uh, getting the targets uh, that we we need. Uh, of course, we need to invest the money from the new Green Deal, uh, the PNRR, um, that foreseen uh, uh, money both for the TSO, for uh, improving the, 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 the grid uh, offshore and onshore, and also for the infrastructure ports area. We have some studies in our countries that also uh, assessed the, the the new jobs that can be generated, the new income from from the ports area in Italy coming from offshore, and it's a very very appealing uh, uh, sector. So I think that we we are still at the beginning, and much work should uh, be done in the in the next years uh, in in the main ports of the southern region, mainly in the also in Sicily and Sardinia. Something has been done in the Lazio region, close to Civita Vecchia Harbor, where they, they, there is the, the, the political will to install an offshore wind turbine in the Tyrrhenian Sea. But uh, I think that uh, the most of the work uh, should still be done. Great, David. And, and now I was asking before I got dumped off about, um, you recently said for Wind Energy Island that in terms of Irish ports, the only current suitable port is is in Belfast so it's on the island of Ireland but it's not it's not an Irish port so it's essentially a lot of the value going into the UK so so what do you want to see in terms of Irish port development yeah look I you're you're, you're right Matt we we only have Belfast on the island of Ireland um that that's ready for this and I think that just means we we urgently need investment and support uh, into our other ports to ensure that they're ready for the opportunities uh, that that you outlined there um both fixed bottom and floating offshore. You know, I, I think in this decade and beyond, um, you know, we need to be have our ports and, and enable them and empower them to be ready for the opportunity and the potential that's there, um, you know, off, off the southeast and west coast in Ireland. Um, this is, to be fair, something that is starting to now get increased att attention um, at government level. So uh, I think, Maria, you mentioned at the start there the, the policy statement on ports that our government released in December 2021. Um, and that set out I suppose the strategy for commercial ports to facilitate offshore renewable energy activity uh, in our seas. Um, the, the main conclusion in this, I guess, is that significant upgrades are needed um, to meet the long-term demands um, and that the Irish government will support the effort through supporting applications for European funding, for example, in the connection, connecting, Europe, connecting Europe facility. So I suppose, what are the next steps really? Um, whether it's true, European or national funding, I think there's a clear and urgent need to deliver strategic investment in our port infrastructure as soon as possible uh, and enable our ports to be ready to build um, and maintain floating wind farms. Uh, you know, 
Belfast is an excellent facility, but we need more port infrastructure to deliver our offshore wind energy ambition, which I mentioned at the start and which, which Maria outlined very well. Um, I think we need a review of our national ports policy to ensure that it it, it does a, a full review to ensure that it supports the development and that, that policy statement um, before Christmas is a good first step. Um, and, you know, enable Irish ports and see how they can enable the construction of offshore wind farms. I think that's really important. Um, and then kind of related to that kind of more widely in the supply chain, um, I think there's a need for us to establish an offshore renewable industry forum uh, with key government stakeholders and industry uh, to agree and implement an action plan uh, to support the development of a domestic offshore renewable energy industry. Um, this would be a kind of a concerted effort between industry, government, and, and the different affected communities and stakeholders, um, because we really need to look at how we can build a whole new industrial sector here in Ireland, support the regional development um, that that brings, and also the, the thousands of jobs and sustainable de development and growth that it will bring to the country. So I think that that's something that really needs to be established. The other point there is the skills gap. So we do have a, a domestic skills gap um, in the offshore renewable energy space here in Ireland. I think we've had a couple of reports notably a couple of years ago, harnessing our potential, which some of you will be aware of that that, that kind of demonstrates where those skills gaps are. I, I think we need to have a high level government group looking to, to implement you know, clear actions and, and addressing the skills gap and making sure that we're well equipped and we have a workforce that's equipped to, to, to capitalize on this opportunity that, that we've discussed. And then also resources for R&D around floating wind energy. You know, um, we need to make sure that we're given the right investment into to floating and supporting technologies such as green hydrogen uh, and, and such as kind of other grid and storage technologies that might be needed to enable us to fulfill our ambition. But, you know, that investment in ports, first and foremost, is the immediate action we need. Um, and then other supply chain actions around that, I think, are really important, too. Great. Thanks. Carolina, if I can bring you in. Simply Blue Energy is a you know, headquarters in Ireland. You're obviously now looking at markets you know, far and wide. but you know, if I can ask you first about the, the Irish market, I mean, you you were, I think, one of the first, if not the first, in terms of bringing projects forwards. There's, those projects are still coming forwards. What do you feel you need to see um, from Irish policymakers to make, you know, make that early play that you made in the floating offshore wind, deliver that and get concrete projects from it? Thank you, Matt. Uh, first, thank you, Matt, for, for the invitation for the discussion. And hello, everyone. Uh, yes, indeed, it's our hope to, uh, of course, Ireland and Irish market, uh, which we are for, for longer years already uh, active in, in, in the blue economy. So the offshore wind is our uh, very big focus uh, right now, uh, growing the team, working with our partners uh, to deliver the projects. Um, I think the Ireland is, is great an example, which uh, is showing this huge floating offshore wind potential, which still it's not much seen uh, in the policy. So we are working very actively and I think that there were a lot of uh, items and the aspects has been already discussed in this discussion. So I'm not going to, to go into much details with the, yeah, with the challenges which are on the market. It's a new market, of course, we, we do see some, some targets, but I think we do believe uh, it should be, of course, more ambition, more ambitious in general, because we have to really capture now that what has to be done within the next years in order to uh, to, to be able to, to to meet the requirements of the energy transition not only for Ireland but but for for the whole Europe so um, when we are looking into Ireland we we see now first fixed bottom but the fixed bottom is really minor part of the offshore wind potential there and that's a bit I think similarity to the world. So we have the 80% of the total offshore wind potential is floating. And now we are seeing the 80% of the targets being fixed. So I think here we need really a big change. We need to create a momentum, not only in Ireland, because of course Ireland is the majority of, of the potential is, is floating, but there are these other countries as UK where of course the natural step, first step was fixed bottom, but then the, the floating is coming as a natural next step. So coming back to Ireland, I think, uh, yeah, we, we need to, 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 to work with the uh, regulatory, uh, with, with the politics to, to really, um, let's say, release this 
option for generation of the portfolio, which is needed to, to generate and, and build up the supply chain and so on and so forth. So we as a company, we are working on stepping stone approach projects where we are starting with the smaller projects to, to really support the local growth, the local supply chain, the local ports. Uh, but in the long term, we need to have a like a clear vision and clear targets, which we see, I think, and we all are, as, as you are mentioning, Mav, we are somewhere around the globe now, if it's the US or Asia, we are seeing starting with this small targets, two, three gigawatts, but for the, the real growth and for the, I would call it sustainable growth of the business, you need to have the, 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 the good, clear targets, which enable to, to, to bring the attention to, to the market. So I think that what, what is needed, it's really the, the floating offshore wind targets in Ireland, it's like the key, offshore floating market in the world so uh, and of course as a company we know it's it, many challenges which has been already worked through there are still with the offtake which we are working uh, with our partners which many other companies are working how to enable to to, to capture this uh, and and utilize not only the e uh, green electrons but the the, the other uh, products as e fuels or hydrogen so i think it's it's very many many uh, aspects combined together but i do believe for the grow the the, the clear ambition um, is needed to, to 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 push the market and and create the momentum for floating. And Ireland is the one example, but we need more places like that in Europe. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. And Elizabeth, you you know a lot about some of these constraints, and you talked about it early on. But um, in in other European markets that we see developing, in France, UK have been mentioned. What, what's being done in those markets around infrastructure like ports or grid capacity that we should be trying to learn from as good examples of how to solve problems early and get some of these constraints out of the way? Thank you, Muff. Yeah, that's actually a good uh, question because you know everyone is this like this floating bubble building up, but the question is then who do I follow? Which are the countries or the examples of, of good practices? Uh, I think there are a few that I'd like to mention. If we see that in, in Italy and Ireland at the moment, ports seem to be uh, or could become a, a bottleneck if it's not properly addressed at the moment. Uh, I think France is a country that, that planned earlier for this. And actually, Wind Europe have been asking uh, since one or two, ye two years, because that's when the pandemic started, and that the countries could actually use their resilience plans, which was the, the recovery plan, um, to also invest on the infrastructure, because this will give confidence to the rest of the supply chain to unlock the investment. So it doesn't mean that uh, with this money, you will just solve all of the infrastructure upgrades, but you will just give really the confidence. And this is what France did. They actually put ports infrastructure as part or greening ports as part of the resilience plan. And now this is approved, you know, by, by government. And now even Macron has announced in the very long longer term to target to 2050. This is very good. And actually the UK, even when I think the UK made like a surprise in terms of they have no target of floating, even when they were the country with the highest uh, offshore wind volume. And then suddenly they say, okay, we do one gig, and now they're going to do five. But it's not only that, it's also the, the type of programs that they are making available for the supply chain. And they are also allocating about the same amount, which is uh, 200 million euros uh, for the investment in creating new factories or facilities in in this case for Wales and Scotland but in the case of France is for the Mediterranean so I think this is a very good practice you know just the fact that the government is backing up and taking these elements which are the industrial part in the in the policy really really makes a big change um, so this is a suggestion uh, I'd say for both Italy Italy and Ireland that's a that's a really great point. Now, of course, um, you know we've also got potential WTO challenge to the UK for some of its work. I mean, the UK has been criticised traditionally for being quite hands off in terms of market approach. That's that's changed over a number of years, and we do see that 
a very an industrial strategy that's what it's called um, but you know that, that more active engagement about what is needed how do we bring forwards investment and that's important i think for a country which doesn't have if you like the domestic players in the market you know they tend to be closer around denmark germany etc um and that's going to be a, a potential challenge here um italy's a really great example of a market where there are strong italian industrials looking to move in some of those um strong oil and gas expertise and good domestic countries um, and equally, of course, the Mediterranean is a new market. So, so first mover advantage in, within the Mediterranean could bring, you know, could bring benefits for countries like Italy that move quickly. Um, and it, Davida, do you think it, that's understood? Are they are the industrials getting ready? I mean, we've got Saipan, we've got Eni, we've got those companies active in this space. Do they see Italy as being a good base to move it elsewhere in Europe and to to put some of these activities in? Yeah, um, I think yes. The industrial, more many of our members in uh, in Italy, they are working on some projects uh, abroad, for example, or even in the north side of Europe or in US. And uh, yes, I think the, the expertise we have the expertise for um, all the, the technologies, uh, starting from Saipem and the, the bigger uh, uh, companies. Uh, but uh, we have to apply that in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, context that is, as you know, is quite different. So that can be the, the, the challenging point in order to, to find, no one knows exactly what will be concretely the, the situation that they will find when they really build up a, an offshore wind in, uh, in the Italian seas, uh, except the one in Taranto that is a near shore, it's not really on, offshore, it's very close to the, to the shoreline. Uh, so I think the, the, the challenge will be that in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, know-how, expertises, and all the, the needed requirements for, uh, for that. Great, thank you. And Carolina, you've got a, you recently announced Simply Blue activity in Spain with a local partner. So is the Mediterranean part of your future plans? And, and, and what do you see as some of the infrastructure challenges to bring projects in the Mediterranean forwards? Right. Uh, yes. So I think that's uh, the recent uh, announcement. Uh, what what you are saying it's showing our commitment. A very 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 big commitment from I think that the, the the Spanish uh, was was the two weeks ago and the last week we had another announcement uh, related to the Baltic Sea, uh, where I think Simply Blue it's it's very much committed to to work in Europe to exactly what I said before, like to generate the momentum for floating. In a way, we, we want to create a good, valuable project pipeline. And uh, uh, continuing with the Mediterranean, uh, it's indeed a very interesting market that is almost entirely floating. So this kind of uh, the situation which we have in our uh, home market in Ireland, we, we can exactly see the, the, in a similar way in, in these different countries around the Mediterranean. Um, so potential is huge. The interest is huge. Uh, there is still missing, of course, this, this uh, huge ambition uh, targets, which I was uh, talking about uh, earlier. Uh, but we do see the interest. So, so that's, that's, of course, the, the timing for us and uh, kind of the sign where we as a company are going to, to work on. Um, and I saw some, some questions around the Mediterranean and the Greece, and let's, let's use the name of, uh, of, of, of the, the other uh, countries which are interesting too. So if it's the Greece or if it's the Turkey, um, I think there are all around the, the, the region which is going to grow together as it's the, the one basin and I do believe that there is a huge potential to create this supply chain around these markets as there is already if it's Spain if it's France if it's Italy the, 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 yeah Greece and, and Turkey again uh, there are some particular assets uh, that the yards and the ports which can be utilized already so we should really think through and uh, the other QA question how to enable this LCOE to, 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 to keep that down really important to, to develop the supply chain in the sustainable way, in the optimized way. So uh, I think there was a lot of discussion in the United States on the local content requirements, which of course are great to enable the local uh, market to, to, to grow. Uh, but I do believe we, we need some regional uh, solutions for, 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 for this, um, um, yeah, for the 
particular, let's say, regions in a way. Um, so coming back, our interest is, is there. We are working with the local uh, partners around different uh, potential and only to come back to that what David said, I think we really have to be focused on the real potential because we are seeing some movement on the near shore offshore wind in the new markets, which I would rather describe very risky. So coming to the new markets, presenting the offshore winds from the beginning, very close to the shore. Uh, yeah, being very, very, um, I think, uh, yeah, could, could bring a lot of uh, uh, resistance uh, between the stakeholders. So being the, the, the uh, early stage developer, we really do understand what does it mean to, to, yeah, to set up a good project and work together uh, on the stakeholder engagement. So I think the we have to be very focused on this real potential, which is kind of the, especially in the Mediterranean region, the floating uh, potential one, not the near shore. So um, just the, the last message, maybe. That's, yeah, that's a good point. And um, we've had a question come in, which um, I should remind people, if you do, please do ask questions, we'll make sure we um, try and get to them. The panel are also doing a great job of answering questions as they're coming up, but we've had questions about public attitudes, support for floating. It is worth highlighting, of course, that if you're in deep water locations, floating doesn't necessarily mean far from shore. Um, we saw some of those LCE maps that Maria, you put up. You know, so floating can be near shore in a way that say the early generation of fixed schemes were. Fix has only gone offshore over time. There are, you know, there are benefits from going further offshore potentially for wind resource, but not necessarily. It's very site specific. So there's lots of issues to, to discuss. Um, Another question has come in, it's for anybody who would like to take it, but asked about vessel constraints. Um, there's a lot of issues here, but let's look at it within the Mediterranean, for example. You know, floating offers an opportunity to build out differently with, with at least some different vessel types, options of onshore construction potentially. Um, do you think, is the work being done to look at um, how you could we profile or use existing shipping infrastructure and expertise, because obviously there's a lot of shipping expertise within the Mediterranean um, that we could use, or is it going to be a case of, of um, importing in that shipping expertise as we grow this floating market? Anyone would like to look at that issue about vessel constraints? I'm not getting any takers here. No, we're going to move on. Well, those, the person who asked that question, uh, Yendi, we'll come back to you on that. We'll make sure you get your question answered. Um, let's move on then. Carolina, you talked about the Baltic. So if I could ask you a bit more about that. You, you've, um, you're active in Poland now. So, but what you, and then Lizette, if you could come in as well, what, and Maria as well, what markets there do you think are interest in floating? Where should we be looking? Where do you think can come forward quickly? And, and uh, okay, so so I will go back to the Baltic. Before Baltic, I, I will try to, to answer very, very briefly to, to the QA, uh, which occurs. Uh, so with regards to the vessel, uh, I think we are doing a lot of work right now in the United States. And we, we do see that, uh, yeah, especially with the John's X and so on and so on uh, and so forth, not coming to the details, uh, we do see that the floating is having an advantages when it comes to the transport and installation. So the um, installation of the turbine on the floater is going to happen uh, in the port. At least that's the, the base case which we are proceeding with uh, for, for, for the projects. And that uh, is connected, of course, more to the um, capabilities in the port. So that's why the sports are so much on, on, the, on the top of our priority. The other piece on the transport is are the tax. So of course, there are the certain vessels which are required to, to tag the, 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 the installation or the structure to, to the side. And so we are doing this kind of the assessment exactly seeing how many tags are around the United States, for example, to, to enable the, the installation on the West Coast, uh, which is entirely floating uh, within the next years for, for this first few gigawatts. And of course, it's, it's, it's challenging too, but at the end, there are the small units. So we do believe it's going to be much easier to get them there than, than providing the huge uh, jack, uh, jackups to, to, to install that offshore. But yeah, we, we are uh, engaging with the EPC uh, I companies who, who are trying to, to find the solutions for, for, for the ports, for the installation. So um, I'm quite 
optimistic on, on, on this aspect, uh, but of course, uh, a lot of work uh, ahead of us. And now uh, maybe shifting a, uh, to, to this uh, Baltic potential, which uh, exactly as a company, Simply Blue Group, um, express the interest and submit the application for uh, the lease, uh, the deepest uh, lease in the uh, maritime special plan uh, in Poland. Um, we do believe, and we did our assessment similarly to, to, to that what GWEC did with the technical potential around different uh, uh, sea basin. Uh, we do see if it's the South Baltic 50 gigawatt technical potential, Poland, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Finland is more than 100 gigawatt, uh, uh, Sweden um, 200, more than 200. Of course, it's the technical potential. We have to, to work on the real potential later. Uh, in the stage, but uh, we cannot hide that. And uh, of course, for, for many countries there, the first step is going to be fixed bottom because it's it's still part of the game. It's, it's the mature technology, which is currently ongoing. But again, seeing that in the long term, I think the countries should consider what is their future. So do they want to invest in the supply chain for the fixed bottom? Do they want to attract supply chain for the fixed bottom? Or maybe they do see their majority of the potential and that's the, the future in the floating wind, which means that they can utilize. And I think similarly to Mediterranean, I do see a lot of potential when it comes to the workforce, uh, skilled workforce around Baltic countries or the ports, which could be utilized for the floating uh, offshore wind. And that's already somehow in our discussion with the supply chain from developers and hearing from the APCIs who are already working with the um, example Polish uh, yards, um, if it comes to, to, to the vessel or some uh, yeah, fixed bottom structures that could be utilized and, uh, and, and let's say adjust for floating later. That's a great thought. Well, let's come back to that. Um, there's obviously a big discussion about how floating and fixed evolve over time alongside each other. Um, but uh, Maria, Lizette, if I could bring you, the two of you in, have you got any thoughts about other markets in, particularly in Northern Europe where you think we should be paying attention to right now? Yes, yeah, so some of the, some of the markets that, that we are following, um, particularly in the very short term are France and the UK. Um, looking broadly at the European markets, there, there's quite a lot of positive noise on, on these rounds and support intentions. Um, without us necessarily seeing that being very specific. Uh, and there's still some uncertainty about to make the big bang to fund the scale up. Um, the UK and, and France floating will most likely start with some stepstone size projects. Uh, France has made a nice runway with sites between 250 to 500 megawatts. There's an indicative support setup. Um, so that looks to be quite a nice runway towards the 2030. Where in the UK, it's not as floating specific, um, but we could see a couple of, of smaller projects, floating projects um, coming out of the, of the next CFD round. Um, and for the next the, the CFD round after that, um, we would expect there to be something more floating technology specific uh, earmarked than that, which could kick off the, the, the stepstone size projects in the UK. Um, Spain and Portugal are also markets with, with some intentions, um, not that specific yet, uh, but, but also some, some quite significant ambitions when it comes to the supply chain setup. Um, there's been some cooperation between Spain and Portugal with some of the, the pilot and administration floating projects in that region. So both because of the potential in that region, but also out of a supply chain buildup, um, there seems to be a quite a level of ambition there. And that, that port example is really, really important one for Spain and Portugal. They've obviously won a lot of work, um, very successful yards, well supported by governments, um, winning early stage work in floating platforms, of course, with principal power in the wind float Atlantic platform, but equally act, still active in the shipbuilding space. You can see, you know, Lizette mentioned the, the UK example, there's a tensions here, aren't there? about you know between countries over winning some of these benefits it would be you know we don't have the, i don't i don't have an answer to be good to get thoughts from other panelists but how those things play out making sure that you know we don't end up with two parochial systems 
but the benefits are shared about even if the, some countries have clear advantages here. May I also comment? Thank you. Uh, well, I think almost everything has been said. First of all, I coming back a bit, I very much agree with Carolina said on the vessels, although we didn't give a full answer, but really the question is, what will be the actual challenge? And it will be not necessarily related to towing of the um, turbines to the site. Um, that will, of course, be then let's say limited or uh, according to the conditions of the waves, because if you are towing this, you have to keep a certain level of the waves and the speed. But then uh, I mentioned this because I also read that someone asked about the technical challenges. So it's m really more about, think about having 50 to 100 turbines in one or two ports and assembling everything next to the quay it takes space you need the infrastructure. So I, I just wanted to say a word on this. And in terms of where do we see floating, um, particularly, I think, Maf, you are addressing the question of where do we see floating wind in the northern part of Europe? Yes. Um, I think my short answer is that where it makes sense. Why? Because, well, basically, you could do floating wind anywhere in the world, right? But is it cost efficient? That's the question. So we looked at this back in 2019 and Wind Europe back then addressed a whole uh, GIS uh, analysis of, okay, uh, what is the future demand by 2050? And according to the European Commission, we need 450 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity. This is to meet about 30% of all of the future electricity demand. Now, out of this, when you include the demand, the location of the demand, uh, the wind resource and the distance to shore, then we come with the most um, attractive areas to make bottom fix and floating. And these results uh, then come with a, a distribution of where this is going to be. So from, from the 450, just to say it quickly, 70 gigawatts were in this socioeconomic uh, analysis, all in the south. So that is uh, mainly the Mediterranean and a bit part of the Atlantic. That means we still have, uh, and I didn't say this, but from the 450, a third, it's floating. So that's between 100 to 150. So I'm just giving you the hint here that, you know, 70 go to the south, you still have at least 30 gigawatts more that are pretty much going to be anywhere from the Atlantic to the Baltic Sea. And that depends on where is it going to be most uh, economical sense, but not only based on the resource, but also once we have make floating wind in the first and most attractive regions, this is gonna bring the cost down by far. And then really the, the choice of the foundation is gonna be on the developer. We're not gonna be, um, let's say, limiting on if they prefer to go for a fixed or a floating foundation, as long as they perform well and deliver the electricity to the grid. So this is this is the answer. Uh, there's really a lot of potential and it will be there in the north as well. That's great. And on that, that point about LCOE, yeah, it's going to be for developers obviously to work out the best sites and that'll depend in part on the policy systems in place in the countries, whether it you know drives them up or or pushes them back down. Um I think you know we've worked this GWEC report, we worked on a presumption that. And it's been said a number of times now, if you can do fixed first, you do fixed first, then you move on to floating. But clearly there's a mix of markets here, aren't there? There are some countries, Lisa, you mentioned the UK, which has got a lot of fixed, but it's got a lot of floating too. And it, uh, you know, it's got a lot of ambitions offshore wind, so it will en end up needing both. So it's now having to do this twin track strategy, if you like, trying to bring on floating while keeping fixed going. But yet it's moving to more challenging fixed sites now. Some of the sites we're seeing in Scotland, the fixed sites are, you know, I mean, are going to be on very deep jackets. So the, as floating evolves, you know, the cost differential may change, of course, therefore, between fixed and floating and the relative advantages. Um, but for some markets like Italy you know, um, and, and longer term Ireland, I think also in this camp, 
you know, it's, you've got it. We've got to get floating right if we're going to see massive growth and, and, and a big expectation. So it would be good to get David now your thoughts on that. You know, the government's there. You're looking at fixed, but you need to see them drive on floating. Um, is there an expectation in those governments about about getting the cost down for floating before they'll back it at scale? Or do they understand that this is a medium term challenge and they need to support early stage schemes and then see the cost reductions that come from that? I, I might take it first, Math, and then, and then pass over to Davida. But um, I, I think from an Irish perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the way we see develop, developing our offshore sector, and I think we need to kind of look at this from where we are. We are at kind of the very starting point here. You know, we have we have one offshore um, farm, one offshore wind farm in operation, a 25 megawatt farm off our east coast. That's it. That was developed in 2004, and there was, you know, we can argue all day about whether there was a missed opportunity there or not, or whether we should have kept going. But we didn't. We 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 prioritized onshore, um, and you know, I I think Maria, you were mentioning earlier about you know we. We, we didn't meet our renewable energy target under, under the RED in 2020. But when it comes to electricity, we have been really successful in deploying renewable electricity. We got to 40%, we, we met our 40% res E target. And it, it's really in transport and heat where we haven't been good. So I, I suppose our challenge now is like taking that success of deployment onshore where we are, you know, up there with the best in terms of integrating uh, renewables onto the system, and, and and trying to do that as successfully offshore. And and I suppose what we're what the the objective really is that five gigawatts by twenty thirty, the majority of that will be fixed bottom. And 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 as I said, we'll have we'll have two auctions. The first one. Um, will be for the, the six, what we call phase one projects. They've been projects that have been around quite a long time. They'll be the first to deliver the most progressed and and they're going to they're going to really, I think, get the industry kickstarted. The second auction then, you know, that's where we see a big potential to kickstart the floating industry um, in Ireland, you know, and, and get that sort of first mover advantage and, 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 and the benefits that that would bring. And I think, Carolina, you mentioned the need to set out floating targets. Whether or not that's what we need in Ireland, I, I definitely think whether it's technology specific in terms of fixed or, or, or fixed bottom or floating or whether it's just, you know, that long term visibility, I think is really what we need. Currently, we have targets in place for 2030, but what comes after 2030 then is still a little bit up in the air. So we will move to a kind of a centralized planning system, a centralized grid system. So we'll, we'll, we'll identify the most suitable areas for renewables and, and air grid, our, our TSO will become the offshore TSO and TAO, and, and they'll kind of see where um, the grid needs to be developed. We don't know how much kind of capacity we want to develop by 2035, 2040, 2050. We have this sort of longer term target and um, the political commitment for 30 gigawatts. I think, Maria, you mentioned already that we have far more potential than 30 gigawatts, particularly off our Atlantic coast and our south coast. Um, and really what I think we need to see now is kind of clear government stepping to stones towards delivering that, uh, you know, offshore. And, and maybe that includes something specific to floating. Maybe it, it doesn't. But I think just that sort of longer term visibility is what we're lacking, because currently we're heading into an auction uh, in, in within the next year, another auction then in probably 24, 25. And then we're not sure what happens. So I think that sort of clarity post 2030 is really what the, the industry needs. And, and Everything I, I I'm I'm reluctant to say everything else will fall into place because we all know things don't fall into place usually that easily. But I think that's the the, the clear kind of signal we need, and then we can start working on the, the the building blocks and the policies under that. That makes sense. Thanks, Niall. And I think we see that in the UK, the the really significant big targets for offshore wind in the UK are all to 2030, um, and after that we move on to more wider goals around, you know, the wider climate activity, um, carbon reduction commitments and net zero. Um, but there's, a, there's enough confidence to keep you going, but at some point we do need to raise our horizons past 2030. It's a really good point, given how long it takes to develop these schemes and how early this floating technology is. Um, David, in terms of Italy, one of the points that was is raised in our report, we highlighted it, is the low cost of other renewables. So if you're the Italian government looking at how to decarbonize, you have other you know, lower cost ways to do that. Um, does the Italian government understand 
if you like that, we've talked about supply chains for the wider benefits, but if you like the, the longer game to be played here in terms of helping support cost reduction and being one of the early mover markets that will help bring flow together and help bring those costs down. Uh, yeah, the, the, the main low cost in Italy and of course uh, onshore wind and the PV that are the, the two pillars for getting the, the 2030 targets. That's the reason also why they split the decrease, one for the more mature technologies that have been published three years ago, and this one defer to for the new ones that, of course, have a higher costs. Uh, the contradiction is that in this one, they consider, as I said, only uh, floating with this tariff. Uh, that's quite good for at least for bigger wind farms, bigger projects for the lower one. Uh, I think that 165 is not enough. We have to increase that at least for the first year. And the contradiction is that on the other side, the government funded a fixed, a bottom fixed project in the Adriatic Sea with the PNRR, with the nuclear deal funds. That's okay, of course, but we think that even bottom fixed can play its role, may, even if the, the main part will be played for um, floating, mainly because of the, the bathymetry problems in Italy and landscaping constraints. We have to move far away, more than 10 kilometers, and there accepted some small areas in the Adriatic Sea with the good uh, wind potentials. All the other ones could not uh, accept uh, bottom fixed uh, wind farms. Okay, great. And we've had a question come in. Um, I'll get your perspective on it first, David. If but um, equally throw open. The, we've been asked about different water depths. We're talking about floating as a generic technology, but of course it's very different in say the UK um, to in the Med where you've got very, very deep water depths, um, hundreds of meters plus. Um, we're gonna talk about California when we do our next webinar where you know, you've got again, very deep waters. So are the, are the challenges, are we up to speed or do we, do we know enough to you think about moving to those deeper stage waters? Or do you think that actually we need to do it in, in, in a sort of the 60 meter water depths first and learn a bit before we move into, say, the Mediterranean? Yeah, maybe I, I don't know if I catch the whole question because of the connection, but yeah, the, the, the problem is that we have to go far, far away. So the distance should be uh, not, should be uh, more than the ones that we usually find in. Uh, in the bottom fixed for uh, for this uh, uh, for the, the project at least they were the main ones we we are dealing with in the Sicily Channel in the Sardinia coast M more of them are far away than 20 kilometers from the coast or 60 or 50 depends on the project but more or less this is the the the, the unit of measure. Yes, and I was asking as well about water depth. Those projects, some of the med projects, are very deep waters. Does that create challenges, do you think, or are people um, ready for developing floating in these deeper waters? Anyone like to come in on that? Maybe Lisa, yeah. want to add yeah, something? Yeah, I want to ask. I want to, sorry, no, I want to make an answer for this. Uh, I am actually very optimistic and confident that the supply chain can deliver even on deeper water depths because uh, even now, we already have um, projects, uh, demonstration projects, of course, that are at uh, up to 200 meter water depth. So it's really um, like we're already doing the connection on the models and everything um, that is needed to understand the differences in the, let's say, aerodynamic loading or hydrodynamic loading when you have a different water depth. So it shouldn't be a, um, a limitation. It's actually a new opportunity and everyone is really taking it seriously because we will be limiting ourselves if we plan solutions that are uh, scalable to up to a hundred meter, right? And of course, then you will also see that the diversity of floaters and solutions makes sense because perhaps for a very deep water, you rather go for a spar than a semi-sub, but this is the kind of solutions and um, decisions that the developer uh, will have to make based on the site conditions. But I don't see it as a limitation and everyone in the industry is very much aware that the US, for example, 
will definitely need um, new approaches. So confident. Great, thanks, Suzanne. I'm conscious of time. Um, so I'm gonna start to wrap up now. Um, I'd just like to say, firstly, thank you to you all for taking part. Um, thanks as well to Shell for their sponsorship of the report and the webinar. We've learned a lot today. I've, it's been really useful for me, um, especially the bits I managed to be here for rather than drop off. Um, but you know, we've had two great profiles about um, two really interesting markets, um, both if you discount that single old Irish um, fixed project, uh, you know, both essentially new to offshore wind, both focused on um, in the medium term on floating. There's a lot of challenges, but as we highlighted in the GWET report, it all comes down to policy and getting the regulation right that builds the market confidence. Um, but we've seen from a number of you that there's a number of different markets out there. They're all active. Yes, we've got leaders like the UK and, and France now um, and Norway in terms of what they're doing, but other markets are trying to get involved. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for all of you for the questions you've asked. We've got to as many as we could. There were some came in about other areas, for example, South America. We'll be dealing with those in our next webinar. Um, and then just want to say, this has been recorded. You may have seen this will be put up by GWEC onto the GWEC YouTube channel later this afternoon. So if you want to go back and, and check what someone said, or if you want to pass this on to colleagues, if they couldn't, um, couldn't make it, please do that. Um, but final, thank you for coming along. Thanks for our speakers. Um, and we'll see you soon at another GWEC webinar.